Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak compassionately to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her compulsory service has ended, that her penalty has been paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice is crying out, clear the Lord's way in the desert. Make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level and rough terrain a valley plain. The Lord's glory will appear and all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. A voice was saying, call out. And another said, what should I call out? All flesh is grass. All its loyalty is like the flowers of the field. The grass dries up and the flower withers when the Lord's breath blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass dries up, the flower withers, but our God's word will exist forever. Go up on a high mountain, messenger Zion, raise your voice and shout, messenger Jerusalem, raise it and don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God, here is the Lord God coming with strength, with a triumphant arm, bringing his reward with him and his payment before him. Like a shepherd, God will tend the flock. He will gather lambs in his arms and lift them onto his lap. He will gently guide the nursing ewes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story of God coming into the world is a story of things that aren't expected. Many expected the Messiah to come to the world as a a king, and instead he comes in the form of a child. Advent helps us to prepare for the unexpected. Last week we talked about how uh, the coming of God oftentimes is through an undercurrent, through things that we hardly see or hardly take notice of. Today we kind of go to the other extreme. We look at a passage of scripture that was just read from Isaiah 40, and at that other extreme, we see the, uh, see the boldness of uh, this proclamation that God is coming to be among us. Uh, today, we, we come again to the prophets who herald, who announce, who remind us to look and to listen for the unexpected. Let's begin our time, if we could, with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, Inspire us with your true and lively word that we may know more of what it means to be your children, that we may faithfully respond to the call of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one in whose name we've gathered and the one in whose name we pray. Amen. I grew up in a family that played sports. And so if you came into our house and looked around, the equipment that you found that was lying all over the floor were bats and balls and helmets and shoulder pads and tennis rackets and golf clubs. And then Laura and I got married, and when our two younger children came along, they were not as interested in sports. They were interested in music. And suddenly around my house were all these things to which I was unaccustomed as a child. All kinds of musical instruments started coming into my house, making all kinds of noises, especially as the children were learning to play them. And before long, one of the things that started coming into our house were electric instruments, electric guitars and electric basses and electric keyboards. And my goodness, there was even at one point in time an electric ukulele. And what I learned very quickly is that with electric instruments, you must also have amplifiers. (laughs) And so now around my house, there are these strange black boxes everywhere. And some are big and some are small, but it is important to know that we have amplifiers. You know, amplifiers place a very important role in the history, particularly of rock music and rock concerts. Um, In the early 1960s, uh, the Beatles came to the United States. And when the Beatles came to the United States, they played several outdoor concerts. 
And there were just thousands and thousands of people who were so excited to see the Beatles. And it was quite a spectacle. And the excitement was evident. But the music at those concerts, quite honestly, was just god-awful. Because the Beatles came with these little tiny amplifiers. And the crowds were so loud and boisterous, you couldn't even hear the music over the crowds. Because they were screaming and they were yelling. And the screaming and the yelling was so loud, the Beatles, the, the, the players themselves, the, the, they couldn't hear one another. And so if you ever watch an old video, say, of the Beatles and their concert at Shea Stadium, you, you recognize how terrible the music was because nobody could hear it. Well, not long after that, in England, there was a man by the name of Jim Marshall. He was an electronics engineer, inventor, and he was an electronics salesperson. And he had a young customer who was about 20 years old by the name of Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend was beginning to form a band that we would later know as The Who. And he went to Jim Marshall and he said to him, Look, I don't ever want to play a concert where my music cannot be heard because of the yelling and the screaming of the crowd. And so Jim Marshall went to work and he put together this really large black box into which he put the largest amp ever known at the time. It was a 100-watt amp. But not only did he put that one amp together, he figured out a way to chain another amp and then another amp and then another amp together until what was finally produced became known as the Marshall Stack. Some of you in this room today have some form of hearing loss because you went to a rock concert earlier in your life where you listened to the blaring of the music through the amplifiers of a Marshall Stack. Now, amplification is important. I mean, we know that. You're listening to my voice right now. You know uh, that my voice is being amplified. It makes it easier for you to hear. It makes it easier for me not to have to talk so loud. Amplification is important. But when it's blaring out, it makes quite a statement. I want to say to you that we need to hear Isaiah 40 today like we are at a rock concert. This is not some passive little statement that's being made by the prophet Isaiah Instead, what we hear, even in the way in which the, the Scripture is read, they are shouting, and they are proclaiming, and they are heralding, and they are calling out with as much volume as possible to amplify it as best as can be heard. The amplified message is, God is with us. You see, that was an important message for the Israelites they had been in exile for more than a generation. They had basically been enslaved. Their way of life had been almost completely wiped out. And now here at the beginning of Isaiah 40, which is often referred to as second Isaiah, Isaiah comes not with this simple, quiet message, but a message that screams, God's salvation is here. God's salvation is coming. God is with us. It's amplified. Now, it's interesting as we talk about expectations during the season of Advent, uh, you know, we, we often uh, talk about the, uh, the things that kind of fit together. And this morning, you'll remember that one of the things that we did was that we lit the candle of peace. And a lot of times we pair words together, don't we? Like a lot of times you take the word peace and the companion word is often quiet. Ever heard that? Peace and quiet. I just want some peace and quiet around my house. And one of the things that is unexpected about the Advent message is that it is not a message of peace and quiet. It is a message of peace and glory. The glory of the Lord that is being revealed among us once again. God is taking those who have been in exile and he is bringing them out. And in the midst of that, what we are called to do is to amplify the message. Advent is not about peace and quiet. It is about peace and glory. And it's a reminder, again, that what we talked about last week 
And that is, is that we are building towards something. You remember last week, one of the things that I said is that Advent is not a countdown to Christmas. Advent is a building towards Christmas. Same thing is true in the, in the uh, prophet's words today. In musical terms, we would say we are moving or building towards crescendo. Advent is the crescendo towards Christmas. And so today we come and talk about the things that need to be amplified in our world and the things that need to be amplified in our lives. Where is it today that we as the people of God who hear this message are willing to turn up this message? I think as we look at this today, we recognize that one of the things that the prophet is talking about is that we as the people of God need to amplify comfort in our world. That is the first thing that is screamed out from this passage today. Comfort, comfort my people. And we learn that God in the midst of Israel's sins has now forgiven Israel. And in fact, he says that they have been paid for two times over. Comfort, comfort my people. You know, part of what I begin to realize is that uh, that's not the world we live in right now. You know, I've come to the conclusion we don't live at home on the range anymore. You remember the song? We learned it growing up. Home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging world. Not in the world we live in today. All we hear today is a discouraging word. Every channel and, 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 and every place I go, it just seems like you turn around the next corner and there's another discouraging word about something. And yet this passage speaks to us like it speaks to the Israelites. Comfort, comfort my people. Let me ask you a question. Who did you encourage this last week? Who was it among your friends or your family that just needed an encouraging word? Who was it that you took a moment last week to encourage? Let me ask you differently. Who are you going to encourage this week? There's plenty of messages of discouragement out there. Who needs a word of comfort this week? Who needs a word of encouragement this week? Who needs a word of hope this week? The voices in our world right now are loud and they are noisy and they are not encouraging. Comfort, comfort my people. How crucial that is. I got to tell you, one of the things that I'm celebrating most in our church's ministry right now is the fact that we have a group of caring servants who are going out every week to other people in our congregation. We have a whole population of people in our church right now that can't come to church. They are either ill or they are homebound uh, or, or they've just had something in their life they can't get out. And we have servants in this church, volunteers, not staff people, who are now going out every week and visiting those people. And they are visiting those people, and sometimes they go and they pray with them. Sometimes they go and take them communion. And sometimes they go and they just sit and listen. Maybe sometimes as long as an hour or two, they just listen to someone who needs to be heard. They are the ambassadors of comfort in this church right now. And I am so grateful for their ministry. That in circumstances to so many families seems so discouraging... Here come the agents of comfort. Here come the ambassadors of comfort. We need, as the people of God, to amplify comfort and the message of God in the world. But I also believe that the scripture today calls us to amplify revelation. Revelation. The glory of God, as it would be noted here, in... Uh, the scripture this morning, probably the most familiar part of Isaiah 40 to us is the part here in the middle that talks about in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight a highway, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Uh, every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain shall be made low, and the uneven ground shall be made even. And we're told that this is the glory of the Lord and that all human beings will experience it together. I don't know how you think about the wilderness, but 
for so many people, when they think about the wilderness, they think about a very stark place. For some people, the wilderness is like a desert, and it's very stark, and it's uninhabitable. Other people, they think about the wilderness, they think about the forest and some place where maybe animals uh, uh, spend a lot of time, but not many human beings. It's, it's, it's a very interesting kind of contrast. And yet in the midst of all of that, one of the things that's true is that if you've ever gone and spent any time in the wilderness, if you will just stop for a moment, open your eyes and your ears, you will see the glory of God everywhere. The glory of God in the sunshine, the glory of the God in, in, in the dew bringing up from the grass, the glory of God in all of the animals and creatures that are around. God is breathing in the midst of creation. And what the prophet Isaiah says is that this is what the salvation of God is like. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together next week. We're going to come together and we're going to hear uh, the annual performance of our adult choir. And this year they're singing a portion of Handel's Messiah. And one of the first pieces we will come across next week is from this very scripture. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. The real question is, are we amplifying the glory of God in our lives right now? What gets amplified? What gets turned up in our lives right now? And the question is whether or not we are willing to glorify God. There is a wonderful poem that was written by Alfred Noyce in 1922 in which he talks about the idea of the magic that is all around us. He says, the magic is all around us. It's in the rocks and in the trees and in the minds of human beings. It's deep, hidden springs magic. And he who strikes the right, the rock just right may very well find what he is looking for. For the one who strikes the rock just right. You know, that, that's how things are revealed in this world. It's a metaphor. You know, we tap into something, don't we? And when we tap into something, then other things are revealed what the prophet is inviting us to do today is to tap into the glory of God because I want to tell you, you know what's tapped into most in the world today? Fear. Fear. People tap into fear because it's accessible. People tap into fear because they think it's a way they can control somebody else. People tap into fear because it's just convenient. The reality of it is, is that while there is fear, what needs to be amplified is the glory of God. We need to stop amplifying and turning up the volume on fear, and we need to start to turn up the volume on the glory of God. We need to tap into that because then it's revealed, and all humanity has the opportunity to see it together. We need to amplify comfort. We need to amplify the revelation of God's glory. And then we need to amplify assurance. You know, there's an interesting part of this passage today in which a voice cries out, and then another voice responds back and says, well, what shall I cry out? And the first voice cries back, shouts back, and says, tell everyone that all flesh is grass, and its loyalty is like the flowers of the field. The grass dries up and the flowers wither. That doesn't sound like good news to me. Human beings are like grass that dry up in the summer. Human beings are like flowers that bloom and then wither away. Does that sound like good news to you? Why would we want to shout that? Why would we want to amplify that? And as we go on and listen to the prophet further... It's because of the certainty of something else. He says the grass dries up, the flower withers, but God's word will exist forever. Certainty. What is 100% certain in your life this morning? What is 1,000% certain in our lives today? You know what it is? Nothing except that God is with us and that God loves us. That is the only thing that's certain in life today. And it's always been that way. In the midst of that certainty, this is why we proclaim Emmanuel. 
right throughout this service. The opening hymn, uh, when we lit the Advent candle, we kept saying the name over and over again. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. This is the one thing that is certain. Human beings are like grass that dry up in the summer. Human beings are like flowers that bloom and then wither. But God's presence, God's word, God's love, God's grace, God's hope, God's peace, God's love, God's joy lasts forever. We have a word for that. The word is assurance. Assurance. It's interesting. Fanny Crosby, when she wrote the great hymn, did not write in the first line, Blessed insurance, Jesus is mine. She wrote, Blessed assurance, God is with us. You know, we have a rather contemporary Christmas story that reminds us of the need for assurance. I guess some of us won't think it's too contemporary, but we'll watch it again this year when it comes on TV. We'll see the story of Bedford Falls and George Bailey who came to understand that it's a wonderful life. But you know, George Bailey, in the midst of the uncertainty of some circumstances that take place, begins to ask the question, how can I even be assured that my life means anything? How can I be assured that my life is even worth anything? And you remember what happens in the story? George Bailey has this wonderful experience with the angel and he gets to see what the world would have been like if he had never been born. Now, all of us, I think, are familiar with the redemption part that happens at the end. Things get straightened out and all these people gather together at George Bailey's home. And there is this moment in which at the end, they start to sing And they start to celebrate in a most profound way. I'd like for you just to spend a couple of minutes with me watching the very last few moments of It's a Wonderful Life. And I want you to look at it through this lens. What do you notice about the way this group sings? I got Mary's telegram. Good idea, Ernie. A toast (laughs) to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. I don't boy, Clarence. thing strike me about the singing at the end of It's a Wonderful Life. The first is this. 
<laughs> These people are not professional singers. <laughs> Listen closely and you'll hear voices that are off key and notes that are not sung exactly in time. But they don't care. They know that what needs to be amplified in that moment is a greater message of hope and joy for the world. The second thing that I notice about the singing is the choice that the uh, writer of It's a Wonderful Life made about which song and carol should be sung. You know, there's lots of Christmas carols that are out there that could have been sung in that moment. You could have sung Silent Night. You could have sung Oh Come All Ye Faithful. But instead, a song was chosen that actually earlier in the story you find out annoys George. He's very annoyed that his daughter is constantly practicing this song. What is this song? It's the great Wesleyan carol. And how does it start? Hark! The herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Thank God for Advent. Because it forces us to ask the question, what is amplified in our lives today? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.